I'm Thomas. I did my PhD with uh, Alan a couple of years back, and now I'm a postdoc with uh, Nicola Palomero Gallagher uh, here in ULIC. Um, so yeah, we're not going to talk about histology. We're going to talk about creating a sort of uh, receptor big brain, if you will. Um, so some of you have heard an earlier iteration of this talk, so you already know all about the data and how it was acquired. However, for people who are new or who want a refresher, I'm going to once again uh, explain what these data are and a bit how they were acquired. Um, so the data we're working with come from uh, human brains and uh, the brains were extracted post-mortem and uh, cut into two to three millimeter slabs. Each of these slabs were frozen separately and then sectioned. Uh, the sections were bathed in a solution for a different radioligand that binds to a different neurotransmitter receptor. These produce uh, autoradiographs, which then give you a 2D representation of uh, neurotransmitter receptor density in the brain. Um, there were three human brains that were acquired and 20 different receptor binding sites for each. Um, something that's important to keep in mind throughout this talk is that these sections are acquired uh, sequentially or serially. So if you have one section, which is for, let's say like AMPA, um, it's another 20 sections till you get back to that same uh, AMPA section. Um, in practice, what this works out to is about a one millimeter spacing between uh, each particular receptor type because there are also missing sections and histological sections and things like that in between. Um, and so for those of you who haven't seen this before, this is sort of what the auto graphs look like to give you just a general idea. Um, and they cover, there's, there's 20 different types, like I mentioned, and they covers the main neurotransmitter receptor families, including glutamate, GABA, and uh, so forth. Um, there are some uh, important uh, problems or limitations that have to be overcome in order to reconstruct these two-dimensional images into 3D. Um, one problem is just the obvious differences in intensities between uh, adjacent images. Um, there's a lot of morphological deformations because the brains had to be acquired um, without uh, fix fixing, um, which causes a lot of problems. There's a lot of non, uh, the, the slabs that I mentioned um, are cut sort of at slightly non-parallel angles to one another. So each slab has to be kind of processed independently. Um, there's a lot of missing or incomplete sections, uh, which creates challenges. And there's also a fair amount of variability in how the auto radiographs were acquired. So there's a lot of stuff that has to be done to get these 2D images into 3D. Um, over the course of my PhD and uh, since then, I've been working on a pipeline to uh, reconstruct all of the receptors. Um, and uh, there's basically four major processing steps that are involved in this. I'm going to talk about the last two more in this talk because that's where there's more updates to give. Uh, but very briefly, there's some pre-processing where we automatically crop the uh, autoradiographs. There's an initial reconstruction where the autoradiographs are aligned to uh, their adjacent neighbors. Um, and then finally we, or not finally, and then, and then we uh, align the initial autoradiograph volumes to the donor MRI in the third step. So I'm gonna talk more about that later. Um, and then finally, uh, and this is new from last year, we, uh, with the help of Conrad, um, developed a, um, an algorithm for uh, interpolating missing receptor densities um, in sections, uh, basically in missing sections for a particular receptor type. Um, so the improvements that have been made uh, in the third step, the alignment of the receptor volumes uh, to the uh, MRI um, are significant. So yeah, this is the section I'm gonna talk about um, because what was originally, what I was doing um, up, uh, last time we, we met um, was basically just taking uh, the initial receptor volume that had, where all the, the autoradiographs are aligned to one another, segmenting it into a sort of gray matter mask and then aligning that to the donor MRI. Uh, now this has a lot of limitations, uh, most notably as you can just see um, the initial receptor uh, gray matter volume is not very good. It's not smooth. Um, and so this kind of poses the question of like how on earth are you ever going to be able to align this uh, to this at a high resolution when you have all this sort of like jagged noise. Um, to overcome this problem, uh, I took us a, a different uh, multi-resolution approach. Um, so the idea here is that we start at a particular resolution, four millimeters, for example. We do the segmentation of the odd radiographs, um, then do the 3D uh, nonlinear alignment to the receptor, uh, to the MRI, um, and then 2D nonlinear alignment, where we take all the sections and then warp them in 2D so that they fit better to the MRI. Um, and then we begin the whole process again at three millimeters, two millimeters, et cetera. Um, and you can kind of see what that gives here. 
um, where if we start off with four millimeters, we segmented uh, the receptor volume, we can then align it to the MRI at the, this stage. We do the 2D section-wise alignment. So here we're really just uh, warping the large anatomical features of the brain just so it has the right shape. Then we begin the whole process again at three millimeters, go down two millimeters. And what you can see is that um, as you go further down in resolution, you end up with a much, much better uh, receptor gray matter mask, which can then be better aligned to the uh, MRI volume, um, both in 3D and then can be better refined in 2D. So even here at one millimeter resolution, you end up actually with something that looks pretty good. Um, and of course here, I'm just showing you data up to one millimeters, but this can be pushed to however uh, high a resolution you want and as much uh, resolution as you can handle with your RAM. Um, now, the next part is the uh, surface-based interpolation of missing densities. Um, so that's the fourth stage. Um, and what was basically being done before is that um, for odd radiographs where there was a missing section, uh, or uh, yeah, at, at positions where we didn't acquire odd radiographs for a particular receptor, we were just uh, estimating that uh, odd radiograph based off of the adjacent odd radiographs in the posterior and anterior direction. So it's really just finding the nearest neighbors and then sort of doing a linear average. Um, this has, of course, uh, significant limitations. One is that it doesn't address these big gaps between the slabs. Um, and it also ignores sort of the laminar distribution of the receptors. Um, it's sort of um, a maybe more subtle point, um, and you can't just see it here, um, but it is an important issue. Basically, um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a complicated issue and I won't go into it unless anybody's curious. To uh, overcome this problem, um, what we have ended up doing is developing a surface-based uh, approach to uh, estimating the missing uh, receptor densities. Um, and I'll go through this uh, little pipeline here that, uh, yeah, in more detail. So the basic idea is that, uh, okay, so here we have our gray matter cortical surface or white matter cortical surface, and then acquired sections here, right? Um, and then the first step uh, is to um, create intermediate surfaces between the gray matter surface and the white matter surface. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, we can then inflate all of these surfaces to a sphere, uh, which will become important later on. Uh, the next thing to do then is to upsample the meshes so that they match the resolution of the autoradiographs or of the reconstructed volumes that you're trying to uh, fill, so to speak. Um, so let's say if you're trying to create a, uh, a receptor volume at 400 microns, you can upsample the mesh to uh, 400 microns. And so what that really means is that um, the you have no edges that are larger than 400 microns. And so the reason that this is important is that it guarantees that for each of these uh, surfaces, um, you will have at least one vertex that is in one of the, uh, the uh, perpendicular autoradiographs. And um, so we can then also resample the spherical surface to the same high resolution. Um, and oh yeah, and uh, something to mention is that uh, I ended up uh, recreating a, a mesh upsampling software to do this. Um, and uh, the reason is that um, the other software that I was that I tried either displaced uh, vertices, uh, probably to like improve the smoothness of the surface, but that wasn't desirable in this case. And also, this upsampling process produces really, really, really large me meshes. So it's important that um, it's sort of optimized to minimize the number of vertices that you need to have the desired resolution. Uh, right, then, so once you have your receptor densities on your surface, that's the green points here, and what we're trying to do is basically estimate what are the, the white uh, dots or the, yeah. Um, so we can basically put these uh, acquired receptor densities onto the corresponding uh, sphere, and then um, using uh, some software from geography, uh, estimate the, uh, do a linear interpolation over the sphere to calculate the missing receptor densities. The reason this makes sense, or the reason this is advantageous is that calculating distances between vertices on a sphere is much, much, much easier than doing it um, on, a, on a complex cortical manifold. Um, and so basically what you end up is, uh, is yeah, with uh, meshes with, uh, oh, sorry, that's actually here. <laughs> yeah, so you, uh, when you do the interpolation, uh, the red dots are the dots, are the, the vertices that have been filled in, 
Um, so you interpolate over the sphere and then you can put it back into your, onto your surfaces and then interpolate back into a volume. Um, and using this approach, you can then produce full 3D maps for the, for the cortex of all of the receptor densities. Um, and again, so this not only fills in the gaps between uh, the slabs, but it also um, uh, does a better job of following the laminar distribution of the receptors through the cortex. Um, now, uh, so at the moment, uh, these all look pretty, but they're just kind of pretty images. Um, and so more work uh, needs to be done to verify that the actual you know, pixel values or voxel values that we have in these are accurate and can be used for science. Um, and that's where this final step of quality control comes in. Um, and I've taken a bit more time than I thought, but um, briefly, uh, the idea, one part of the quality control is to verify that the values that we produce in the reconstructed volume um, are the same as were in the auto-rated graphs. That is to say that the reconstruction pipeline doesn't distort the uh, values in one way or another. Um, and to do that, uh, I looked at, I used an atlas, uh, the U-Brain atlas, um, and then uh, transformed it into the space of the auto-rated graphs, into the space of the aligned uh, receptors, uh, the aligned auto-rated graphs, into the surface space and um, onto the reconstructed volume. And that way we can check for each region, what is the average amount of receptor binding density um, in each of those regions. Um, oh, right, and I should also mention, um, so this is still very preliminary data. Uh, unfortunately, we had a hardware malfunction about three weeks ago, so I lost everything that I had done. I mean, not the code or anything like that, but so I had to rerun everything. And so uh, this is still very provisional data. Um, so with that caveat, um, so here we have the quality, this quality control algorithm that's been run for slab one at a one millimeter reconstruction. Um, so uh, at, for the raw auto radiographs, of course, they have 100% accuracy. That's our baseline. Uh, with the uh, aligned sections that the accuracy goes down a bit, um, it gets uh, somewhat worse for the, on the surface, and then somewhat improves for the reconstructed sections, um, except for some outliers. Um, now, this is still very preliminary. This is not like the final accuracy of the reconstruction pipeline. This is more of a benchmark against which we can evaluate further improvements to the reconstruction pipeline. Um, and so you might say like, oh, well, this one, uh, region 242 looks really bad. Why is that? I haven't had a chance to look yet. And that's actually why this is useful. Now I can see, okay, this isn't working well. And I can kind of go and hone in on what are the problems in the pipeline in a quantitative way. Um, but overall, actually, so um, if we just look here, there is a bit of uh, dispersion around 100% accuracy, but it's not too, too bad. It's between like 90 and 110. So uh, even at one millimeter, um, it's not too, too bad. Um, and it will hopefully improve as we get to finer resolutions. Um, the second way of evaluating, of doing quality control on these uh, reconstructed volumes is evaluating how accurate our interpolation algorithm is for estimating missing receptor densities. Um, and basically the way we do this is applying the uh, surface interpolation algorithm within acquired sections. So within these acquired sections, all the vertices that we, that, uh, that we have, uh, we know the receptor density. Um, and so what we can do is knock out some of those uh, vertices and then try to see how well we can sort of backfill them in with the surface interpolation. Um, and to do that, uh, I have a little toy example here where we have a bunch of vertices. And the idea is that we, in theory, we know the receptor densities at all of these vertices. But what we can do is knock out a core of them, these ones here, the green and purple, um, and then using the, uh, the known receptors, the ones that are in red, the border, uh, we can uh, estimate how well we recover these values. Um, and then we can uh, create a certain distance between the known values and then the value or the vertices to be estimated. And so we have, have an idea of like over X distance, we have a certain percentage accuracy in recovering the receptor densities. Um, and then what that gives you uh, is uh, this. Um, so doing a random sample of a thousand vertices in the acquired sections, again, in slab one, um, reconstructed at one millimeter. Um, what we see is, uh, well, there's a pretty big dispersion of, in the error level. Um, however, like I said at the beginning, um, uh, most of the sections are about one millimeter spaced away from each other. So the furthest distance you're going to get away from an acquired section is probably about uh, 0.5 millimeters. 
Um, so the error level that in practice we're probably looking at is somewhere around like here. Um, and so that's again about like 10% uh, error. Um, so that's not as good as we definitely want it to be, but it's definitely, it's not, uh, it's not terrible either. Um, and so again, this is just a benchmark against which we can evaluate further uh, improvements in the reconstruction software. Um, so I'm going over time. So I'll briefly mention the to-do list. Again, refine and finalize the current pipeline to maximize uh, accuracy so that we can finish the, the first methodological publication, uh, create some error maps for the interpolated regions, uh, and then other improvements and applying this to the full set of three brains. Okay, so I'm just over time. So I'll leave it at that. And uh, I don't know if we have time for questions. Great, thank you very much, Thomas. Lovely talk.